All right, friends, you are in for a treat. We are here with one of the leading New Testament scholars of our day, written a ton of books, commentaries on the historical Jesus, on biblical books, written a fascinating two-volume set on miracles, multi-volume commentary on the book of Acts. But today, we're going to have one of what we call our behind-the-scenes interviews. Where I've got some questions for, for Dr. Keener, and if we have time, we'll take a bunch here uh, from you as well about his life, about the books that influenced him, about his marriage. We're going to hear some untold stories from Dr. Craig Keener. So first off, Dr. Keener, I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's, it's my privilege to be with you. Well, you're too kind, and I'd love to start with your story to faith because I think it's fascinating and interesting. I'd love to have you tell the audience how you went from being an atheist to a believer. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was that was marvelous. It was totally unmerited on my part. I I thought Christians were uh, I mean, it sounds awful to say it, but I thought Christians were stupid <laughs> and I made fun of them. But hmm. there were some Christians I didn't make fun of because I knew they were actually serious about their faith. Hmm. But it looked to me like, you know, I just kind of dismissed them as anomalies and said like eighty percent of the people in this country claim to be Christian, but they don't live like it makes a difference if I really believed there was a God that made me. I would give God everything. Wow. But it doesn't look like they're serious, so why should I why should I take them seriously? But then um, you know the stakes are kinda high. I didn't I didn't know about Pascal's wager yet. Hmm. So, but but I did understand that the stakes were kinda high because if I was wrong, I mean forever is a long time. So even if it's just a one or two percent chance, I didn't want to stake all that on, you know, what if, I, if I'm, I, I wasn't sure that I was right, a hundred percent sure. And plus I was exploring a lot of different religions and philosophies, just reading about them. But one day a couple guys uh, dressed in, um, you know, black suits and uh, white, white shirts and ties and, <laughs> uh, very, very conservative. Uh, walked up to me on the street, and they were out preaching. They were fundamental Baptists, and they asked me if I knew where I was going to go when I died. Well, that was rather a concern to me, but I made a joke out of it. I said, oh, probably either heaven or hell, because I assumed they were probably Christians, and that's what Christians believe. But they didn't laugh. They started saying, mm. well, how, do, you know, do you know how you can go to heaven rather than hell? And so I you know, I ended up arguing with them for about 45 minutes. But, you know, I was trying to be respectful because they seemed to be serious about what they were saying. But finally, I, I said, look, you guys, can you show me? I mean, you're just giving me stuff from the Bible that says how to be made right with God. Can you give me any other evidence? And when I saw that they weren't going to give me any other evidence, I said, okay. I have a question for you. Where did the dinosaur bones come from? Okay. You ask a stupid question, you get a stupid answer. They weren't paleontologists, and neither were they trained in apologetics. <laughs> they said the devil put them there to deceive us. Wow. And, okay, but these were the only people who were out witnessing, you know? So God mm. works through whoever. Mm. I mean, they were they were the ones who were obedient. <laughs> In terms of sharing the faith, I mean, there are others. I mean, I suppose if I showed up at the church, I'd hear. But anyway, I said, "Okay, you guys, I'll see you later." <laughs> that was that was it for me. I started walking off, and they said, "Basically, you're hardening your heart against God, and and it will become harder and harder until you become incapable of repentance." Now, a year later, I did track them down. Wow. And and they, and they said, we thought you were one guy who'd never get saved. But that afternoon, as I was walking home, I was so convicted by the Holy Spirit. Wow. I wanted a different kind of evidence, but he gave me the evidence of his presence. And it was so overwhelming. By the time I got to, to my room, I was just so overwhelmed with the presence of God. It was like, how are you going to tell God that you don't believe in him when he's right there? <laughs> It was overwhelming. I'd never experienced anything like that before. And finally, you know, my knees buckled out from under me. I, I cried out, God, 
okay, I don't understand. They said that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead, and that makes me right with you. I don't understand how that works. So God, if you want to make me right with you, I'll believe it if that's what you're saying, but if you want to make me right with you, you're going to have to do it yourself. And all of a sudden I felt something rushing through my body like I'd never felt before. I jumped up so fast, I was like, what just happened? Something just came inside of me. Was that God? Or Christians also, they believe in gargoyles. Maybe it was a gargoyle. I didn't, I didn't know anything about Christianity, really. Uh, not much. I mean, I'd heard of the Trinity and gargoyles. But anyway. Sure. <laughs> so I figured, okay, well, I always said that if I ever believed there was a God, I would I'd give my life to him. So I guess I better. Um, and if I want to be a Christian, I better find out what that entails. So I found a, a pocket New Testament. Back then, Gideons were allowed to give those out in school. And yeah, I, had, I couldn't. It took me a while to find it. But once I found it, I you know, dusted it off and started at the beginning. And and a couple of days later, I walked into a church figuring that all well, these Christians, they, they've been right all along and they knew something that I didn't. I was scared, though, that they could look at me and tell that I've been an atheist so long and they'd really look down on me. But, wow. Um, but they, they didn't have all the superpowers I thought that they would. <laughs> <laughs> Some may, may have had certain gifts, but huh. uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't tell me, go away, you used to be an atheist. So that was good. <laughs> so you said school. Were you in high school, junior high? How old were you? Yeah, I was 15. Um, you were, okay. Yeah, but if I, I know, I know people think ah, he was fifteen. He wasn't. He wasn't a very convinced atheist at fifteen. But they don't know like <laughs> the backstory of all that. And uh, I mean, I was reading Plato at thirteen, and actually, Plato was one of the ones who started getting my attention to to question my atheism because I know you had a, like a twelve year old on a while ago. So I I did, the, the, yeah. You can think who can think ahead of their usual age range. But yeah, um, but, but Plato got me thinking about questions of life after death. And even though he didn't really answer the question satisfactorily, he asked some, some of the right questions. I, I, I think I'd been an atheist at least since nine. I remember at nine wow. I'm asking if I believed in life after death. Uh, or maybe I asked her anyway, it, I didn't believe in it. And, um, yeah, and my, my mother was an agnostic at that point. And, yeah. So at nine years old, an atheist, 15 years yeah. old, you became a believer. H yeah. How did that change the trajectory of your life? Like, were you, what were you planning on doing at that stage? And how did you decide that you wanted to become a professor and a writer? Well, the career change didn't come right away. I, I wanted to be an astrophysicist. And oh, wow. Nothing wrong with, I mean, it's great to be an astrophysicist. Hugh Ross, for example, is a great <laughs> astrophysicist. Um, I, I, I knew that was one place you could look for truth, and I wanted truth. And yeah, God has revealed himself in nature, and there is truth to be found there. It just wouldn't have saved me. <laughs> but, mm. you know, I started reading the Bible, developed a hunger for the scripture, the little kids in Sunday school, they knew more about the Bible than I did. I, you know, mm. they, they'd been raised with it, or were being raised with it, I should say. You know, and I, I didn't know anything. Um, but I found out if you read 40 chapters of the Bible a day, you can get through the New Testament once a week or through the Bible once a month. Wow. And so I started, you know, trying to catch up with those kids, started immersing myself in, in the Bible. And... Some, some of it, of course, I didn't understand, and some of it I misunderstood. I had, I had studied Greek mythology a lot. and Okay. We, I'd studied ancient Mediterranean, ancient Near Eastern cultures, things like that. Everything except, except the Bible, <laughs> you know, from, yeah. from uh, antiquity, you know, that, that part of the world from antiquity. So sometimes I... I mean, I, I was reading Plato into Romans 8. That was that was bad. You come up with Gnosticism if you do that. Mm. Um, on the other hand, I was reading Ovid's Metamorphosis into Acts chapter 14. And actually, 
that probably was the right background for that. But then I was reading a Greek, the Greek mythology of Deucalion and Pyra into the flood story in Genesis 6 through 9, and thinking, oh, no, they borrowed this from the Greeks, not knowing, of course, mm. the, flood the Greek story. Uh, it's actually much closer to the Babylonian story or whatever. But anyway, uh, and plus, you know, if, if there was going to be a flood, you'd think that maybe a few different cultures descended from there would remember it. But anyway, sure. I was... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I had a lot of growing to do, but um, the Bible was the place to, to look. Yeah. So so you were 15, your mom was an agnostic, you became a Christian. What happened when you told your family, when you told your mom, what was the response to that? Well, my, my parents, you know, we didn't really discuss religion. They weren't hmm. they weren't against religion. They, they wanted everybody to have their own choice what they believed. But um, I was kind of radical for Jesus. And so they thought it was an occult because, I mean, it was a complete change. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. like I just read an, an article in the encyclopedia about determinism and come out and said, I'm a determinist. Or some of the other things I went through where a few days later I'd be exploring something else. This was like complete change in direction in my mm -hmm. life. Uh, now, I don't want to freak freak people out. I, I left out a part of the story. Is it going to freak people out too much if I... Uh, I haven't told you which thing I'm thinking about. But Do it, please. I want to hear. Now I'm curious. <laughs> right, right. Just, just so you all know, Sean is not responsible for this. He didn't know oh, the dance. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I visited the church that, that Sunday... And everybody was nice to me, and they invited me back for the evening service. And so that night I went, I went back for the evening service. And the pastor, the uh, people went forward for prayer afterwards. And I really didn't know what prayer was supposed to look like. I thought you're supposed to close your hands and bow your head. Or, you know, so I was looking around trying to see how you're supposed to do it. And the pastor tapped me on the shoulder. I told him that morning that I'd become a Christian. And he said, are, are you sure that you were saved? And I said, I don't know. I don't know if I did it right. And so the pastor led me in, you know, the traditional sinner's prayer. And on the way, as he was leading me there, I was like, so what happens to people before Jesus came? What happens to people who never heard, heard the gospel? You know, asking him all these questions that are, you know, People debate <laughs> they're hard, hard questions. Uh, and he said, we'll deal with that later. Let's deal with this first. So he led me in that prayer. And I felt the same overwhelming presence of God I felt mm. two days before. And all I could do, this time I didn't try to cut it off. All I could do was just in awe of God's greatness. All I could do was just thank him and praise him. <sighs> but I knew... I didn't. I didn't know the words to adequately to, that would be okay. worthy of him. And so, you know, you know, I, I was like, God, you have to give me the words even to praise you. And and you know, there's lots of languages that started coming out in another language. Wow. So that, that went on for like a couple hours. Uh, I think it was. A wow. Few hours. Wow. And, and and just I experienced a joy I'd never experienced before. Now again, I know this is not what happens to everybody. Sure. But to me, it was just such a seminal event in my life, existentially. I didn't know there was a biblical name for that experience. Uh, and I know not everybody believes in it. That's why I'm saying, don't blame Sean. He's not the one. <laughs> uh, uh, let, let, let me ask you this, if this makes sense. You know, my father was setting out to disprove Christianity. He wasn't an atheist, but was an agnostic. And the experience, he said, that made it, he knew it was true, was not the evidence. It was when... He went to his father and unplanned just said, Dad, I love you and I forgive you. And it like spontaneously came out of him. That's when he goes, holy cow, it's real. God has changed my life. Is that mm -hmm. what it was for you? It wasn't so much the evidence. Was it that experience that just solidified it? Like, I know this is real. Or am I reading something into your experience? Uh, with, I, m I met Jesus. <laughs> that, was, hmm. that was what changed my life totally. Hmm. I wanted evidence. But... I didn't know where to look for it. And it was actually a pastor of a, of a different church that was near the, the high school 
uh, I, I stopped at different churches. I, I talked to pastors. I learned from, learned from them from a lot of different Christian traditions. And um, this pastor shared with me a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And, Are you serious? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were, there were other, other books, too, at, at that wow. time in my life. But that one was really helpful because evidence, wow. I really needed it. I still had a lot of questions left over. Um, often they say with conversions from a sociological perspective, you kind of get socialized into it through relationships. Well, that didn't happen to me. Mine was sudden, and I, and I had a lot of questions that still needed to be answered. Now I was answering them from a... Hmm. You know, I had a different starting point now, but I still, and, and and there were some people who like, they didn't believe you were supposed to ask those kind of questions, but I could only suppress them so long. Sure. And even reading the Bible, it raised questions to me because, you know, the first time reading through the Gospels, you know, I read Matthew, it's fine, everything's great. I read Mark, wait a minute. This happened before. Jesus got crucified and rose again at the end of Matthew. How often is this going to happen? <laughs> that was, I, oh, I, I got gotcha. you. They said, okay, this is the word of God. And so I'm thinking, I'm thinking Quran like word of God, like it has to be dictated. I wasn't understanding that God inspired the different authors. And so you have multiple gospels coming at the mm -hmm. same events from different angles. And um, so you get a like a 3D, more of a 3D picture, 40, picture, whatever. Uh, so a lot of the stuff I'm doing now actually responds to some of the seminal questions I had starting off as a, as a new Christian wow. with no Christian background, almost no Christian background whatsoever. Um, I say almost because I did know people who were Christians. And I, you know, again, I'd heard of the Trinity. I heard Jesus died. Sure. And those things like that. But, so, Craig, given that you had such a dramatic experience, have you had seasons of doubt in your life? Like maybe when you went to Duke Seminary and probably learned a lot of stuff that challenged you. Have there been seasons of doubt you've wrestled through? Sure. Um, actually, Duke wasn't wasn't as much as, as some of the other ones. And early on, I struggled. Um, I, f I found... I found evidence, but I didn't know enough yet. And so I kept uh, kept searching, but but the relationship with God really helped me because I found I could bring mm. the questions to him. I could ask mm. him questions and he would he would actually give me answers. He would, mm. you know, if I wanted to know, well, what about this? He would, he would bring to my mind something in scripture and um, and sometimes I'd ask him questions where maybe the answer was um, more abstract or something, but he would he would give me answers and uh, initially I threw out all the stuff I'd had before because I said it had led me astray. So I threw out Greek philosophy, I threw out, well, definitely threw out Greek mythology, um, but eventually I saw some of it is helpful for understanding the, the context in which the New Testament was written and yeah. and so uh, how they contextualized for their audience. And I still needed the Jewish background. But, hmm. um, but I mean, even now, there'll be seasons where I'll think of something or think of an objection. I'll think, okay, well, what, what's a good answer for that? And I'll pray. <laughs> And the, the Lord will lead me to a, a wow. good answer. So, wow. I, I, you know, it, it, not always instantly, sure. sometimes instantly. But I think we often don't understand how much we think our mind and our emotions are completely separate compartments. Mm. But they really, there's really a lot of overlap. I think a lot of uh, neuroscience has shown just how integrated a lot of our circuits that's not the right way to put it but you know hmm. some of the things that didn't make sense to me didn't make sense to me because of the worldview i was starting with sure and once you accept a, a worldview 
the Christian worldview actually made sense of a whole lot of things that I couldn't make sense of before. I had, I had platonic idealism on one side, I had empiricism on the other, uh, pure, pure, pure naturalistic, you know, uh, just matter, nothing else on, on the one side. And I thought that that ex could explain the, the universe, but it couldn't explain myself, my own consciousness as a sentient being. So I went to Plato for that. But, you know, never the twain shall meet. They, there was no way to reconcile mm. them from a Christian worldview where you have an infinite God who, who made us in his image. Oh, it makes sense. Even before I was a Christian, I got to the place mm. where I said, you know, Immortality would be great that, that Plato talks about, but we are finite, and and you know he talked about you know the pre-existence of the soul, but I I couldn't see that, and so with us being finite, it seemed like the only way we could ever have eternal life. Back then, I spoke of immortality. The only way we could ever have that would be if an eternal and infinite being cared about us enough to give it to us and why would that being care about us i mean hmm. if if there was an infinite being you'd have to be infinitely loving oh that would be the best of all worlds hmm. and guess what he is he is infinitely loving wow how oh, i love that thanks for opening up about about your story there's so many things here i did not know so uh, those of you who just chimed in, we are here with uh, Dr. Craig Keener, one of the leading New Testament scholars of our day, and we're just exploring the people and books uh, that have shaped his life and his background story. So you are married. Uh, you have a unique marriage. You are white, and your wife is black. I've never met your wife, but we live in such racialized times right now. Two questions. The first one is just, can you tell us, how did you meet your wife? And then second, I'd love to know, in just kind of the cultural moment we're in, given the uniqueness of your marriage, is there something you would want the church to know that maybe we could do better in terms of race relations the way Jesus wants us to? So let's start with how, how you met your wife. Uh, <laughs> this book uh, talks mm. about it. That's a picture of us on the cover, except I had hair back then even on the top of my head. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I was doing my PhD at Duke at that point and the, in, in, in New Testament. And Medine was an exchange student from Congo in Central Africa. And we both met through University Christian Fellowship. Hmm. Um, they were starting a graduate chapter. We were both involved with the undergrads too, but we, but also the, the graduate chapter. And ah, she was quite lovely, but I wasn't really up mm. for a relationship at that point. Uh, I was still smarting from some wounds from earlier. And mm. so, um, but we got to be really good friends and I'd share Christ with somebody and and they'd say, oh, Medina Musunga told me the same thing. I'm like, okay. Good. She, she's fired up for Jesus. She's witnessing to people, uh, which is how I got saved. So I value mm. it very highly. But uh, I think we participate in international Bible study together and, and so forth. Well, she went back to France to finish her PhD there. Uh, she she had just been in the U.S. for a year. She was doing her dissertation on African American history, so wow. it helped her to come to the country and study Americans. And in the long run, oh, she got one. But uh, she she went back. She finished her doctorate. We kept in touch, writing each other. I was always happy to hear from her. And I was praying that God would give her a good husband. And she was praying that God would give me a good wife. And she went back to Congo in the midst of a civil war. And she... Uh, the civil war that was going on when she got there eventually ended, but then some years later she was caught up in another civil war. Wow. And the last letter I got from her before she couldn't send me any more letters, it said, 
please pray for me. I know you pray for me anyway, but please pray for me now. My cousin was just shot dead. My father and my brother just narrowly missed being shot dead. Wow. We've been told that the troops that are gathering outside the city have orders to start killing the educated people first. And she said, I don't know if I'm going to live or die. By the time the letter reached me, because somebody had to take it out of the country and mail it from sure. the country. By the time the letter reached me, her town had been burned down. And Holy I didn't know cow. if it was if she was alive or dead. So, you know, sometimes I'm slow at making decisions. I had been fond of her before, but, and, and we had actually discussed our interest by, by letter before, okay. but um, anyway, I, I, I was like, Lord, if I had not been so slow, what if I had married her? She wouldn't be going through this, but she'd be panicking wow. about it. A bit. Anyway, but I felt like the Lord said to my heart that he knew how much I cared about her. She was one of my closest friends, knew how much I cared about her. And he would do what was best for her and what was best for me. And I felt like also he said that someday we would minister together. Um, no, I, I assumed that that was what she had told me before, that if I ever came to her country, she'd translate for me in French. So, I mean, I didn't, I didn't get any big ideas from that, but um, I was praying for frantically and, you know, meanwhile, she and her family were, were fleeing in the forest. Any given time, one of them was close to death with sickness. Wow. Um, sleeping out, you know, malaria that was huge because they had no protection from the mosquitoes. She would often be walking like uh, 10 miles through snake infested swamps and fields of army ants. She'd have to pick them off her body. The ants, not the, not the snakes. Gosh. Um, uh, just, just to get food for the family. It, it was a horrendous situation. The water was contaminated, everything anyway. So 18 months later, um, she finally is able to emerge from the, the forest after the war and we're finally able to reunite. And we decided not to um, not to be so slow about making up <laughs> minds. You know, we're, we're old enough to get married by this point. So anyway, I we, did. We, 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 we got married and it's been, been wonderful. Wow, that's that's an amazing story. Those of you just listening to this, uh, Dr. Craig Keener's written it in his book, Impossible Love, the story with his wife. Uh, I've read a lot of your books, have not read that one. Now I'm super intrigued. But let, let me ask you, she's from Congo, you said. You're from the States. In our time right now where there's so much racial tension, is there just any thoughts or reflections or insights you would speak into the church from your unique experience? Yeah. You know, when I, before we, before we got together, in fact, even before we were friends, I, I was part of an African-American group on, the, on Duke's campus. And then um, I, I was ordained in an African-American church. And at the time, I was like, boy, it'd be great if the Bible really spoke directly to racial reconciliation, but I think it doesn't. But once I started really grappling with it, it was like, it's all over the place. I mean, in the New mm -hmm. Testament, it wasn't black and white. That wasn't the issue in the ancient Mediterranean world. But Jewish Gentile, now that was an issue. And, and that was a barrier that God himself established. So if he would mm -hmm. summon us to surmount that, how much more would he summon us to surmount every other barrier in history? Mm -hmm. In human experience and so you know i started you know preaching and teaching from that but you know you see also how he's made us all one body in christ it hurts it hurts jesus the same way it would hurt us if you know we have part of our body being ripped off it hurts jesus when we're divided mm -hmm. and if we love jesus we want to to look for unity with one another 
Unity doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. Unity does mean that we love one another so much that whether we agree or not, we're going to listen to one another and learn from one another. We don't really have the right even to say we disagree until we've mm. heard the other's perspective. And I learned so much when I became part of this African American church. This was in North Carolina, you know, where I was where I was at Duke. Okay. Um, in the in the late eighties, uh, in early nineties. So it was, you know, it, it was it was after the civil rights movement. So we 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 had already come some distance, but I thought, you know, wow, the civil rights movement must have taken care of everything. But then I'm hanging around my African American friends, and they start talking with each other about, you know, somebody called them an N word that day, and somebody did this to them that day, and I'm like. Is this real? This is really still going on. Wow. And I and I asked my friend Arthur after everybody else had left the room, Arthur, this doesn't happen often, does it? So he told me about his first college level English class where the teacher after class called him aside and he was the only one left in the room with her, said, You're not gonna pass this class. And if you tell anybody I told you this, it'll be your word against mine. So you just need to drop the course. It was the first day of class. He was the only African-American student in the class. Wow. That blew my mind. And so sometimes we don't, you know, when we say we disagree, we don't know people's experience unless we hear them. Hmm. And the, the same epistemology, in a sense, that I need to use as a scholar, I need to, I need to get everything on the table, listen to it, evaluate it and hopefully do so charitably. I don't have to agree with everything, but I should at least be charitable. We can at least do that with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can't really listen to them if they can't trust us enough to share their hearts with us because we don't have a relationship. So we need to be open to building those relationships and we need to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and certainly slow to anger. That's that's beautiful. Thank you for for speaking that. That's that's well said. T before I asked you about uh, the people that have most influenced your life, and you're like, I don't even know where to start. So <laughs> obviously, there's going to be a ton of people through different stages in your life. But tell us about maybe just one or two people at any season in your life that had a real just kind of stamp and influence on who you are. Sure. If I start with my early Christian life, my seminal Christian life, even then there'd be a lot of people, but um, my my pastor back then, he was a gracious and humble man. I didn't know how much to appreciate it at that point because I didn't really have that much to compare that, that with. But he was, he put up with a lot for me. But he would, he would often take me, you know, when he would do hospital visitation and so on. Hmm. He's kind of mentoring hmm. me. And he didn't have all the answers for all my questions, but he was he was gracious. I remember at one point I had a major theological change. I shouldn't say major, but you know, initially I thought, okay, I just need to believe what my church teaches me because I don't know anything. But as I'm reading the Bible, sometimes I come up with some stuff that doesn't quite fit what I was taught. And so this was one of them. I, I dutifully learned all the all the memory verses for this one particular doctrine. Uh, it's it's not a cardinal cardinal doctrine, even for that denomination, but um, but it was one that many people held very dearly in terms of a particular eschatological uh, view. <laughs> and so, you know, that revolutionized me because I said I need to go back to the to the Bible and search everything for myself. That was good, but you know, my pastor he didn't hold that view, but he was he was like, okay, well, I had a Said I had a professor in Bible college who held that view. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a respectable Christian view. Hmm. There was a guest evangelist who took me aside, spent the whole afternoon trying to talk me out of it. Wow! Uh, giving all these verse references, and with every reference he'd give, I, I just go through the context and I say, but look, look at the context. It doesn't mean that. Hmm. He got so frustrated. He finally said. <laughs> you need to believe this. All men of God believe this. Jimmy Swaggart, Jim Baker, they believe this. This was this was wow. the seventy. 
Wow. Um, <laughs> so I said, you're right. I need to believe that. But then, then I visited another church and heard that nobody until 1830 believed that. And I'm like, phew. <laughs> oh, my I guess goodness. I just believe what the Bible says. So, um, but, um, but my pastor was very gracious, very mm. patient. And then um, actually uh, another person, I mean, a lot of my undergrad professors influenced me. And of course, my graduate professors and so on. And I, I could name a bunch of them right now. Uh, I hate to leave any of them out. But if I'm going to leave some out, I'll just leave all of them out except one. <laughs> okay. um, everybody knows he was my mentor. Uh, Be Benny Aker was hmm. uh, one of my undergrad professors. And he's not, well, he hasn't published very much. But the impact he had on his students was tremendous. There was... Um, kind of a divide in our Bible college between the people who wanted to be spiritual and the people who wanted to mm. be academic. You know, so the spiritual people would pray a lot and the academic people would study the Bible a lot. I mean, what kind of divide is that? That's so silly. But anyway, I mean, why can't you be both? So, but having having said that, I, uh, I, I was trying to be on the spiritual side, but, uh, but I, I, I would feel the Holy Spirit speaking to me, touching me in these academic courses. I mean, in, in second year Greek with mm -hmm. Benny Aker, I feel the spirit as we were studying Greek grammar of Galatians. I'm like, wow. Okay, well, and, and as I would be praying and, and trying to listen to God's voice and I'd be asking him something, I'd feel like he showed me something in prayer. A week later, Ben Aker would say that in his Romans class. I'm like, mm. so... You can hear God's voice in prayer, and you can hear God's voice in exegesis. Now, you, you all think this is crazy, because here's this New Testament scholar, but I'm telling you about my seminal experiences that helped propel me towards being a New Testament scholar. Um, and, and, and he's the one who really opened up the world of New Testament scholarship for me. I mean, he said, oh, there are hundreds of, hundreds of articles uh, being published every year on biblical studies. I'm like, hmm. wow, I didn't know that. I thought we just had the Bible. And, and then there were, um, I also found that some of the things that I found reading the Bible, some of the people who held those views were scholars. And I'm like, okay, so you can be a scholar and be faithful to the Bible. I, I know this all sounds so stupid, but from where, it doesn't. From where I was coming from, I didn't, I didn't know that. So hmm. it was, uh, yeah, those things were were very seminal influences in my life. And, and Ben Aker integrated hmm. devotion to Jesus and uh, exegetical skill and working with backgrounds and so on. Initially, I didn't think we, we should use background because I thought if you, once you admit that you need background to understand the Bible, you will have to, uh, well, you'll say you didn't understand it well enough before you used it. Eventually, I realized that's kind of like saying that once you admit that Greek and Hebrew will help you understand the Bible better, you're taking the Bible out of people's hands by saying they need Greek and Hebrew. No, you, mm. you can understand it more. You can understand it better. I mean, there's things I still don't understand, mm. plenty of things I still don't understand. I'm still learning every day. So, you know, but when I was reading 40 chapters a day, eventually it strikes me that here are things that that say Paul takes for granted that his audience knows, but I don't know. That makes and sense. Some of, some of them I knew because because I'd previously studied the Greco-Roman world. I'd read Tacitus and so on as a kid, but um, I read Homer, but well, Homer didn't help as much as Tacitus did. But but when um, you know when I finally realized, that, and, it, and it was good for me to realize it because. I really felt conflicted about not greeting people with a holy kiss and things like that. Hmm. So once I started realizing the value of background, I was like, okay, well, let me get one book that will help me understand the background. And then I'll just use that along with the Bible and I can go out and preach. And I didn't find such a book. And so I, you know, just started getting hunger for the background and you know, read the Talmud, read, uh, of course, Josephus and Pseudepigrapha and all sorts of other things. 
because um, I really needed the Jewish background in particular at that point. And then later would read Cicero and Seneca and, and so forth, get the Epictetus. And, hmm. um, and finally, you know, by the time I'm finishing my, my doctorate at Duke, I'm like, this is unrealistic to expect everybody to do all this before they go out and preach. What I wanted at the beginning was just one book. That was, so that's why I wrote the background commentary. Yep. Uh, the, the New Testament volume. And mm -hmm. happily, somebody else wrote the Old Testament volume because otherwise I would have had to go and do another PhD. That would have been hard. <laughs> sure. Well, the first time I met you years ago, you sent me your commentary in Matthew and your biblical backgrounds book. And I've used both extensively you sent me your commentary on john i've used that i'm currently going through your galatians right now looking forward to first peter coming out uh read read a lot of your different works so let me ask you this do you have a favorite book of the bible or favorite story in the bible that just resonates with you or you just love the whole thing i love the whole thing i i guess you know revelation is one of my favorite books mm. um, Acts is one of my favorite books. Right now, I'm writing a commentary on Mark, and right wow. now, Mark is my favorite book <laughs> because okay. it's okay. a long time to finish. But, um, it's going to be as detailed, I think, as the Acts commentary, the, the four wow. volume group. Not the, wow. not the, they have a one volume one with Cambridge. Yep. Uh, uh, but uh, this one's for the ICC series. But I, mean, I love, I love all of it. Um, I love Exodus. I love it's just where where do you where do you stop? Some parts of it I understand better than others. Sure. But, yeah. Out, outside of the Bible, what what books most influenced you? By Christians, ancient books, Plato, whatever it is. Maybe just one or two or three books that jumped your mind that just really influenced your thinking or your life at whatever stage you you want to mention. Plato Plato was more as a kid, I, uh, probably Epictetus. Uh, I liked Stoics better than Plato uh, as a Christian, but in, in, my, in my early Christian life, George Ladd was really influential, hmm. uh, George and Ladd. So his theology of the New Testament was really a, a major, but, but even, even some of his other works were game changers for me. I mean, I loved Jeremias. Uh, I loved some of the other scholarship I was reading at that time, but but Ladd, I could identify with him. He was solidly evangelical, and he was he was a really good scholar, biblical scholar, and he was honest. I mean, he tried he he went with what he found, even if it got him in trouble with a lot of people. He just had a passion for for God's word and for uh, I guess slicing it accurately. And there, there were others, Richard Longnecker, um, Robert Gundry, um, mm. Gordon Fee, because I was in Pentecostal wow. circles at that point. And, uh -huh. or, well, I, I had been for a while at that point. And, and Gordon Fee was the, like, the scholar we could look up to, especially who was um, Pentecostal. You know, he emphasized gifts of the Spirit. And, and he... He was a really good scholar. F.F. F. Bruce, of course, had influence. I mean, a lot of the, the major uh, evangelical scholars of that time, I Hoard Marshall, uh, but, but George Ladd was the one who oh, wow. really influenced me the most at that point. Very interesting. Now, now this is going to be somewhat of a, a, a loaded question. And what I mean by that is you've written a ton of books, a ton of commentaries that have helped, sold hundreds of thousands, maybe more, had a huge influence. What are the ways that you try to just keep yourself focused and humble amidst that influence and not lose track of who God has called you to be and what he's called you to do? Well, when I don't keep myself humble, there's plenty of things to humble me. <laughs> so <laughs> my wife, she can slap me up. Well, I mean, not physically, she doesn't slap me. But... <laughs> of course. <laughs> You please take out the garbage, <laughs> you know. Um, and the Lord certainly. I mean, you know. And, and, and when I read the Bible, I mean, it confronts me with things I need to to grow in. Hmm. So if you if you ask the person who's influenced me the most 
uh, I want to say Jesus, but then I'm scared people will say, well, you've got a long way to go to be like Jesus. <laughs> but I mean, if you know where I was before and how far the Lord has brought me, uh, of course, he is the, the biggest influence. But I, I'm still learning. I still have. Uh, hmm. Yeah, there's plenty to keep me humble. And yeah, when I'm working on a big project like what I'm working on now, it's going to take me years to finish this. Wow. And I keep looking at it every day. But that that can help keep you humble, too. And when you, you, you look at the people who are on the front lines and, you know, I, I have some friends who are planting churches in a, a previously unevangelized region. And God is doing just such remarkable things through them. So many thousands of people have come to Christ. God is is doing miracles there to get people's attention for the gospel. You know, and here I am sitting in front of a computer most of the day. Mm. Uh, or or uh, you can take a break from that to, to read offline. It's easier on my eyes, easier on my back. And sure. so on the near side, so I'm always leaning over the computer. And yeah, there's plenty to plenty to keep me humble. Uh, now, were you asking about my uh, what I have to do to get my work done in terms of my scholarly schedule? I I would love to ask you about that. That was on my list. I don't. I mean, I don't know how you possibly keep coming out with commentaries and books every six months. How, like, what's just give us an insight glimpse of of how this happens. I'm not sure if it's every six months. The, uh, it, and then some of them, like the, the one volume Acts commentary, it, it's it's easier. I mean, it was painful. I had to cut 90% of the big Acts commentary. Yeah. But it, it's, it's at least I already had the research done. I just had to you know, trim it. Okay. It was painful. But, it was, but then for some things, back around 1980, which is probably before a lot of my students were born. It's kind of embarrassing. But around 1980, when I was a sophomore or thereabouts, I, uh, for my Greek three paper, that's when I started collecting my research on index cards. Uh, well, like, I wasn't planning <laughs> to show them, but like, wow. like yeah, you know, I have a, uh, how do I do this? With the Hold it kind of right in front of your face, if you can. Right in front of my face. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then we can see it. There you go. Out of my face. So, okay. um, so just collecting it, thinking, okay, this will be useful for sermons. This will be useful for, you know, future papers if I if I write any more. Because at the time I was planning to go to Bible college two years and then just go out and preach. Uh, the word had other plans for me. Ben, ben Aker's example actually was one reason because I saw that he was impacting so many future pastors and that I could really fulfill my calling more accurately. I skipped my calling, but I could, uh, in, in terms of recounting it, but I could I could fulfill that more fully actually as a, as a teacher of pastors and now a teacher of doctoral students as well as pastors. And um, so I, uh, I, I just started collecting those, and initially I had, you know, maybe, I think I had like 109 footnotes in that, in that paper. Uh, it's the first time I got an A from Ben Aker. <laughs> <laughs> he he really kept the standard high, you know. Um, but then I went to, um, well, I just kept taking notes and just this passion to get more and more background. So by the time I finished my doctorate, I had 70,000 index cards. Wow. Eventually, it was 100,000 index cards. By the time I finally realized, because when I started, we didn't have personal computers. We didn't have mm. Mac computers. And so I, I couldn't do that. And I couldn't afford one all the way through my doctoral work until like, well, until after my last paper. I finally had one in time for my, my dissertation. Wow. But that made a huge difference. And so eventually I stopped taking the notes on index cards and would just type straight into the, the computer. But gotcha. For a few years, I was just doing it 
anyway, so I've got, what, 40 years of research now that I can build on. <clears throat> so whenever I'm writing a new, you know, commentary on a different book of the Bible, well, I've already researched background. I've already filed a lot of that background uh, in, in the verses for which I thought it would be relevant because, you know, I would hang stuff kind of in my mind on, okay, which verses would this be relevant for? So what I have to do then is just catch up on the most recent scholarship and work okay. my way through this again. I mean, I, I've already worked my way through all the texts in, in the New Testament for sure in Greek and have had already read earlier commentaries, but now um, trying to catch up on the more recent ones. And, and I have to catch up on the recent ones because now I have friends writing commentaries and <laughs> really embarrassing when I realize, oops, I forgot to, uh, I forgot to read their, their commentary. Huh. I can't read everything though. It's too much today. Yeah, that's for sure. Do you use something like Logos Bible software now? Rick McCleary was asking that question. I should. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff available on there. I, I use Accordance. But that's that's what I've been using since I I first got Bible software, uh, and and it's it's very good for my needs. But Logos is also very good, so mm. um, recommend either one. Would you tell us a little bit of what you're working on right now? I know you've got this First Peter commentary coming out, I believe, this summer. Then you mentioned a book on miracles in the fall. So tell us a little bit about about both of those, if you don't mind. <clears throat> First Peter was interesting because uh, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, periodically calls a, a Lambeth conference and they, they have, uh, well, anyway, the, the current Archbishop, Justin Welby, was going to do, uh, I think it's going to be this summer, the Lambeth conference for the Anglican Church on First Peter. And so um, a scholar that he works with invited a bunch of us scholars to come together at Lambeth Palace to discuss First Peter. And I had a whole lot of background already on First Peter. I just wasn't up on all the more recent commentaries. So I collected the background, spent about a week pulling that together from my files, my electronic files, because it was already typed in by that point. Not everything is. And just circulated it. But then, you know, after that, that conference uh, of, of the scholars, I thought, and there, there were Anglican scholars, and uh, I'm, I'm not Anglican, but I was happy to be privileged to be invited. So I started uh, thinking, well, you know what, I've already got this stuff organized now. I may as well just go ahead and write a commentary. And <laughs> oh, wow. I asked, asked my publisher if we'd they'd like it. They said, yeah. So I went ahead and, and did that. The the miracles book, but, but well, I, I mean, I had to catch up on the, on the reading. I'm sorry. I, sure. I cut back and forth. I'm, I'm actually ADHD, which <laughs> makes it a miracle that I actually can concentrate long enough to write <laughs> books. But that's a habit now. So, but also uh, with, with the, with the miracles book, I, I had realized, you know, people would talk about my miracles book and I'd read claims on the internet, both by supporters and detractors that made it clear to me that they hadn't actually read the book and <laughs> didn't wow. even know what I was precisely arguing sometimes. Yep. So, uh, you know, but it's 1100 pages. So I thought, you know, I really need to write a shorter one sooner or later. And the um, Carl Henry Center had a, a grant where each year they're, they're doing um, something related to science and, um, and faith. And anyway, I got, I got the grant to, to go to uh, Trinity International University for Great. a semester. And my, my project was to do another miracles book that would be more readable for more people. Mm. So it wouldn't concentrate as much on philosophy of religion, which 
uh, philosophy of religion, philosophy of science, some of that was the stuff that was hardest for me. I mean, doctor philosophy doesn't mean literally you <laughs> have a lot of training in philosophy. Sure. So, um, but then there were other parts of the book that were really fun and parts that I thought people would really enjoy. So I, I made certain parts shorter. I, I reused certain parts, but for the most part, probably 70% of the material is new. Oh, wow. I found out well, since then. Yeah. And once I wrote the book, there were more people who were willing to give me medical documentation for their healings. And wow. Books, which, you know, before <sighs> I was just going with the people I knew. I didn't know where to look uh, or, or people that I interviewed and, and, and so on. But yeah, I have, I think, a stronger, stronger case. And some atheists didn't like the tone of the previous book. I don't know why, but, um, but I, I mean, I, okay. a former atheist, I can understand why it wouldn't sound right to certain sure. people. So I'm hoping the newer one will be more friendly to a larger number of readers. Just they understand up front I'm a Christian, but here's what I think is good evidence, and it's up to them what they. <laughs> what they think, but I, I think it's pretty compelling. Well, I am totally looking forward to that book because we chatted beforehand. Your book's coming out in October on miracles. Philosopher J.P. Moreland, who uh, we teach together at Biola, has a book on miracles coming out in November. So this is a really good sign. Well, we will have you on. If you want to come back, I would love to talk about that, get into the research, help spread the word so as many people as possible, skeptics and Christians alike, uh, will pick that up. Craig, I've got a ton more questions for you, but you have been super generous with your time. Really, really appreciate you coming on and want to encourage folks. I've been reading your commentary on Galatians. I read the book of Galatians. It's six chapters, not 40. Just been reading it each morning all the way through. And then I just kind of have worked through some of the, the sections in your book and just thoroughly enjoying it. So, so grateful for your research, your discipline, uh, all the work you're putting out. Just really grateful for that and for you coming on and sharing your story has has been awesome. Those of you still with us, uh, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other behind the scenes interviews coming up. Wayne Grudem is gonna come on soon, interestingly enough. And we've got some other topics, Carl Truman coming on to talk about his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, which is one of the best books I've personally read in probably six months, and a whole bunch of other topics. So make sure you hit subscribe. And if you've ever thought about studying apologetics, come study with us at Biola. Maybe interesting for you to Craig, Craig to know is we are fully distanced now in our apologetics program. So that's a pretty neat uh, neat thing we didn't have before. Or if you're watching this going, I want a little more apologetics training, not ready for masters. We actually have a certificate program where we will kind of guide you through some good lectures and just simple lessons to be certified. There's a discount below. So last thing tomorrow, actually going to do a live Q&A with my father at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I roped him out. I was like, Dad, let's do a live McDowell Q&A. So we're going to bring on two generations, do our best to answer your questions. That's 11 o'clock. Uh, make sure you join us if you're available. Uh, Craig, hang on. I just want to say thanks, but really appreciate you coming on. And to everybody, thanks for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock.